Okay, so I propose we start since it's already five past 12. Um, so I would like to welcome you all. Good afternoon. Welcome to the Nick Web Table Talk on Vapor Satellite Data and Games. And before we start off, I would like to point out that this webinar is being recorded and I kindly request you to remain muted until you are given the floor. Um, if you are not okay with this um, webinar being recorded, you now have the opportunity to unfortunately leave the session. Um, my name is Rana Abdulhadi and I've been a volunteer at Stichting Nick since last year, October. And this session is brought to you by the Nick Foundation, which stands for the Netherlands International Cooperation Collection. And what we do at NIC is we create timelines on various topics related to international cooperation. And if you would like to learn more about this, you can visit stichtingnic.nl and my colleagues will provide the link in the chat. So today's table talk will be about remote sensing data tools. Um, we will talk about VAPOR that originated out of policymakers' demand, uh, but we also have two other examples of the usage of remote sensing data. Uh, we will also talk about IRIWATCH, which is a tool that helps farmers and their irrigators to optimize irrigation water applications. And in addition to that, we will also talk about Cerberus, which is a game-based crowdsourcing platform that translates photographic satellite data into usable GIS data through gaming. And for this table talk, we have a very interesting panel. We have Job Klein, who is a former diplomat at the Dutch Ministry of Foreign Affairs in uh, water affairs, water diplomacy for the MENA region. And he is also one of the initiators of the VAPOR. Um, we also have Professor Wim Bastiaanse, who is an international academic leader and is engaged as a visiting professor at Delft University of Technology, the TU Delft. Uh, he holds a PhD degree in crop soil atmospheric physics from Wageningen University, and Wim leads the IRIWATCH team. Uh, we also have Hans van het Wout, who is the CEO and founder of Blackshore, uh, which initiated the game-based crowdsourcing platform Cerberus. And this table talk will be one hour. The first 30 minutes uh, will be an introduction by the panelists on the three tools. Uh, each of them will talk about 10 minutes uh, about the tools. And the last 30 minutes will be a Q&A, um, whereby all of you, the participants, have the opportunity to ask questions to the panelists. Uh, I invite you all to um, ask your questions in the chat box. and. After 30 minutes, I will read some of the questions out loud. And if you would like to, you have the opportunity to reflect on your question, but no more than two minutes since we are with many participants. And um, I'm wondering, Job, could you say in one minute a few words about remote sensing data? And yeah, maybe also the goal of this uh, table talk. Uh, yes, okay. <laughs> thank you uh, all all of, of you present uh, present here, but also Nick for organizing this about the, the, the session about organizing, how to organize data. Now, as, a, as an introduction, we see around us there is an overload of data. And what we did 20 years and 10 years ago cannot be compared with what is possible today. So in the past data was often power and just kept hidden. The change we see now is that more and more data are simply open and shared to make it all transparent. And even recently, with more data from remote sensing and the use of satellites, our world has really changed. So the supply of data is a blessing, but also comes for us with responsibilities and even ethical questions. For the demand of data, it is often, I notice, still the unknown. I always use the example, nobody needed a smartphone when we still had a Nokia. It was unknown. And after people used the, 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 the iPhone, we all saw the benefits and now we simply cannot do without it. So in this talk, I hope we have the opportunities <clears throat> of using this scala of data. What all is available? Now, the triggers, the challenge of today is for suppliers, for suppliers of the data to get it to the minds of the potential users and prove the benefits of all the data. 
In fact, we even could say data in search of users. I think that is basically our challenge of today and of this webinar. Runner. Thank you, Joop. Thank you. Well, certainly I cannot do without my smartphone. So you made a clear point there. Um, I want to begin with asking the audience, actually, because we're going to start with Vapor. And I want to ask you something through a poll. Um, I would like to ask you, who do you think are the main stakeholders in Vapor? So if it's correct, you can see a poll now. I will give you about 30 seconds to answer it. So who will be the main stakeholders in Vapor? We can already see results coming in. I see policymakers is taking the lead. Nobody thinks it's intended for NGOs. That's interesting. Let's wait for another five seconds. Policymakers are still in the lead. Yes, yeah, so you can see that clearly everybody, um, well, most of everybody thinks it's intended for policymakers. Um, I see also some people think it's intended for universities and for farmers. Um, so you, I would like to ask you, can you tell us a bit more about the history of Vapor and maybe also reflect on this question about who the main stakeholders are in Vapor? Yes, of course. Can I share, can I, interesting, by the way, yeah. Um, can I share my screen? I Definitely. Have I have a slide. Yeah. Okay, so talking about the supply and demand, the WAPOR is a request, was eff effect a request of data. And that's, that's relevant to mention. Now, in short, um, I brief you about the birth of the open source database, which is called then WAPOR. Now, I take you back to 2010, uh, where it was posted in the Dutch embassy dealing with the development sector. Now, the main donors in the water sector were the Germans, the World Bank, and the Dutch. And all three were working in the water sector already for decades. And during our regular meetings on progress, you really could notice a, a, a way of fatigue in the group. Now, what was the reason? Access to water dropped after all these decades of work. You can see on the left, on the left column, these are uh, pictures of the UN of UN water. That in fact, that was good to mention just before the war. That in fact, the, the access to water dropped, when in other countries the uh, access to water actually improved. I mean, it was a time of still the Millennium Development Goals were there. Now, in Yemen, what you also noticed, in fact, is that even the water table dropped by, by even you can see here in Sana by, by eight meters. And on the other hand, all the donors funding increased. So, I mean, you really had the opposite of the two. Now, one day I had my lucky day and being at the embassy, I had a visit of, of a professor who completed a World Bank training uh, with the Yemeni Minister of Water. And he explained to them how to use remote sensing to improve water resources management. Now, for me, that discussion was the eye opener. And he showed me that Yemen, as a water scarce country, used around three times more water to grow crops compared to other countries in the same climatic zone. Now, really, for me, things became clear that we never would be able to achieve anything if this was the cause. Obvious that no water was left for drinking and we could monitor this, but we didn't. So we discussed it with the, I discussed it with the ministry and who were clear in their reply. We do not believe in remote sensing. On top of that, I realized that most of the data owned by the ministry was hardly shared. You could say a kind of monopolizing the data. Now, important for me became that only financing in infrastructure was not a solution. 
how could we justify, I mean, in, in fact, our, our existence in Yemen? Of course, it was widely known that agriculture was a large user. Therefore, agriculture, water use, including the efficiency, should be monitored. And all of this set off against the water resources available and the amount of water users, like drinking. So where is the balance? So what we needed was an open discussion, how the available water is shared and prioritized. The trigger question there is, in fact, is water considered to be a social good or is it to be an economic good? Now, as the Netherlands, we teamed up with the UN Food and Agriculture Organization, the FAO, and they managed, and they managed to have a, uh, to organize a meeting with the Speaker of the Parliament, which, by the way, is unusual. And after sharing our concerns, I still can remember the speaker's remark. He said, how would I know that we misuse water? In short, we agreed that open data was needed. After meeting with the parliament members, ministries and farmers, the big issue, in fact, became the ownership of data. In fact, what I noticed is the transparency was at stake. Finally, the conclusion was that Jamin requested a public open source database and the Netherlands was willing to finance that. So a start was made with the data based on, on these pictures you see there. And we had to stop because of the worsening of the security situation. In fact, we talk about all before 2015. Now, the concept was taken up by FAO headquarters in Rome. And that in fact was the start of the WAPOR because the initiative was taken at that time to, um, to uh, the Middle East and to Africa. Now, what does the WAPOR mean? The main topic of, of WAPOR is to monitor the water productivity. And I cannot see my own screen now with this. I just got a problem. So what you want with the water productivity is that you want the you 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 calculate the water which is needed to produce crops. So what is the ultimate aim? Is to increase your crops and to lower your 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 amount of water use to produce a crop. So that effect is the main indicator. But of course, WAPOR provides more data. So I'm not going to mention all this, but I mean, CO2 intake, rainfall, everything is part of the, of the WAPOR database as such. So now, just to say um, for the WAPOR itself, it's Africa and the Middle East. And the data is on 250 meters, 100 meters, and 30 meters. Now, the database itself is managed by the UN, and it means all data is free and open source. And crucial importance, of course, for the whole thing is that it's the regular validation is there of the model and the data itself. And, and um, so the, the, the validation, oh, hang on, there's another one. The valid is my mother, so I cannot escape. Um, the um, data um, is there for open for all of us. And what you notice is that governments itself are, are really interested in this. So already in 2018, when, the, when it was just more or less coming up, I just have to switch off my phone. Sorry, I forgot to do this. Um, the, in particular, the, the Jordan Ministry, I can remember 2018, was interested because they had an issue about how to monitor illegal water use. And there, in fact, they requested, in fact, WAPOR to be used in, in, um, in, um, in Jordan. The other point is that the data available in the database started in the 2009 
So for governments now, you're able to make trends, how it was in 2009 and how it is up till today. Yeah? So it's all new real time basis, which is just go start 2009 up till today. Um, I show you now a few pictures of the WAPR itself. These are still from Iraq, which was from last week. This is Mali, which I wanted to show. And this is the 250 meters, which you can see. This is the 100 meters. And here you have an example where you see, in fact, the development over time from 2009 up to today. So, and there you see, in fact, on the, on the corner down here, you see the water use which is used to produce this crop. Now, it's clear in fact that you make this data open and transparency now is the key because in fact now, in fact, it's, it's, it's for policymakers, but as you mentioned about the stakeholders, also NGOs. So if you talk about water scarcity, you are the shortage of water. In fact, here at this scene, where all the water disappears to. So these are issues about equality, where you talk about is water relevant for uh, economic or for social good? I mean, is there sufficient water for all functions? Now, this is part of the, this is part of the database. I show you a few, a few more. Oh yeah, this is a request we got from Somalia. In fact, at that time, when they mentioned that was last year, whether they could expect drought. Now, in fact, if, you see the development of biomass over the period of the last 10 years, then you can already predict whether you will have a, a, a drought coming up this year. Here you can see in fact, for example, that this was the, 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 the period when they had the drought in, in, um, in, uh, in Somalia and in a couple of years ago. And here in fact, you see already that last year, the biomass was already over a period below the drought year. So you could expect that the drought was also coming up last year. This is an example where you can see in fact that the water quality activity in an irrigation scheme at the tail end is, is, is much worse compared to the, uh, the starting point. So this effect for, for basin uh, management systems, basin management, it, it's, it's clear to know how your, how your water is being divided. Uh, in Egypt, for example, they worked on, on direct for the farmers. They talked about the, they managed to, to, to develop applications for the farmers itself. Uh, now to make it, to come to a conclusion, uh, so WAPOR, in fact, was initiated by the need of data. In fact, it originated from, from Yemen, where they asked, in fact, to have a data which could be open and people could use it. And it's the only public available near real time database. It's operational. Everybody can open it and it is completely open source. Uh, it's proven to work. I mean, the validation is there and already many governments are using it. And as I said, what is important is that the validation is a crucial part of the WAPOR. This is a short introduction. Thank you, Rana. Thanks, Job. That was very interesting for sort of taking us through the history of WAPOR. Um, so if we reflect on the poll, Job, um, would you say then that the main stakeholders are the policymakers? Well, I think it, 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 it depends. I mean, and for me, I know within within the, the, the makers of 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 Wapor it differs. For me, as a, as a, as as the one starting it or one was initiated, it was for policy making. It was really from the highest level to see is the equality in terms of water use. At the same time, of course, universities are the ones who are preparing, in fact, for the ministries the 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 the, the tools and farmers. Uh, these, are the, these are the people, in fact, who finally have to make the change. So, I mean, it's about the applications which are useful for the farmers. But, I mean, the farmers itself cannot directly use the VAPOR to improve their efficiency. I mean, that's why you need the intermediaries to make applications for the farmers itself. 
So, but policymakers really can make it straight away. They can use it, I mean, right from the, right from the raw data. Okay, so it's more on a higher sort of strategic level, if I understand correctly. It's for a strategic level, but in fact, we didn't mention here startups. I mean, the whole intention also is that startup in those countries, they can make use of, of satellite data now and to make applications directly for farmers level. But that intermediary is there. But for startups, I think it's a wealth of information where they really could, could, could use to improve their, their systems. So I think it, it's, it has a variety of, of stakeholders, but it's, it's, as I said, it's the only database in fact, which is available, which has new real time uh, uh, data and, and it, it's open source. So it's, it's brilliant, so to say. <laughs> okay, thank you so much, Job. I already see an interesting question in the chat and we will reflect on that um, okay. after, after some time. Um, I would like to move on to the next poll. Um, the next uh, part will be about EriWatch. Um, and I would like to ask the same question to the audience. So who do you think will be the main stakeholders in EriWatch? I sort of gave an introductory sentence. Um, so please fill out your results. I see that Farmers is uh, already very popular. Let's give it another 10 seconds. Yeah, I see that uh, Farmers is, uh, is taking the win in this. So um, I would like to ask, um, I would like to ask Wim, could you tell us a bit more about EriWatch? Could you tell us a bit more about its application in agriculture and also reflect on this question? So who are the main stakeholders? And the floor is yours, Wim. Yeah, thank you, <laughs> Rana, and I'd like to, do that by sharing my screen. If that is okay. Can you see my screen? Yes, we can. Thanks. Um, because um, EriWatch is indeed meant for uh, farmers. Um, because I have also been working for a long time with agencies and governments and United Nations. Um, and, but you can draft very nice policy, but if you, in the end, are not helping the farmers, yeah, then the actions on the ground will not change. Uh, so what was for me a major driver to create a startup, <laughs> so basically I'm representing a startup now, is to um, yeah, develop uh, these applications for, for farms. Um, so let me see, is it moving? Um, so on the second slide, you see an example um, that I would like to take over from Job on Jordan. And so the very uh, strong uh, aspect of WAPOR is that you have now um, 10 years of data in the archive, some data 250 meters, some data are at 100 meter. And um, this is one of the things you can do with that. It's an additional example. Um, so in Jordan, there is a lot of unauthorized groundwater use, about 60 to 70% is illegal. And that has, that's creating, of course, a lot of problems. So this is an, an, uh, an example that we calculated very recently with FAO um, on the base of WAPOR data. So we calculate how much irrigation water was applied in 2015 and then again in 2019. And um, yeah, many of them are illegal, but because of this uh, uh, very rapid decline of the groundwater tables, you, could, you can see here that many of the pivots, center pivot irrigation systems active in 2015 are now already uh, closing and uh, because you, you don't find them back in 2019. Validation is always important. Uh, so here you can see on the left panel also a validation graph and between the estimates of the amount of irrigation water applied and also how much was measured by the wells. Uh, and you can see here that that's in a very nice uh, agreement. But nothing will change if you're not going to help the farmers. And uh, EriWatch is, an, uh, is, a, is, a, is a company that is aiming at helping farmers uh, worldwide. And 
um, yeah, how, how do you do that? Well, I mean, one of the very first things is that uh, you tell them when to irrigate and when not. Uh, so we, we actually um, tell them the day of the week uh, that they have to irrigate. So this is number one, but also um, the amount of water. And um, very interestingly, um, you know, 10, 20 years ago, you were needing 30 engineers to do all the image processing. And now you can do everything in the cloud. Yeah. And also um, a lot of data is now available from, from WAPOR. Uh, and uh, that can really um, provide the kind of a quick start to develop these kind of applications. Now, this is an example of an irrigation advice on a pixel by pixel basis. This is 10 meter by 10 meter. But yeah, in reality, uh, most farmers cannot irrigate uh, with such high precision. So um, we summarize that on a field by field basis. Uh, so, those fields here in Guatemala and sugarcane need to be irrigated every day. And they basically take a data subscription and then uh, on a commercial basis, and they then get this information. Now, what is also interesting is that um, they irrigate with, uh, with hydrants uh, and with sprinklers. And here you can see that all these sprinkler lines um, have a separated, let's say, boundary. Um, why? Well, they said, look, we have a team here of people that operate those blocks, those, those farms, but we need to know which of the, um, say, pipelines really need to get water today. So they have the hydrant in every uh, field, they have an opening, and they can make the connection and they want, the team wants to know which field do we really have to irrigate today and for how long. Now we calculate this in millimeter. And so this, uh, this hydrant needs 24 millimeter, other ones maybe 19 millimeter. And the ones here in dark, they do not need any water. And in this way, you can really uh, reach out to farmers to, to help them. I will give you another example. This one comes from India, from smallholders. Every field here is, um, let's say, uh, half a hectare or, or one acre or one fedan. Uh, so very small fields, all potatoes. Uh, and uh, yet, um, together with a local um, provider of um, an, 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 an app in, in Hindi language, we were able to reach out to those potato farmers. And the ones that are in the control group, which are the farmers that farm and irrigate as usual, got 28 ton of potatoes. And the ones that were following the, the treatment, uh, they got 37 ton. Uh, and that's exactly what you want. Not only to save water, but also to give a higher production. Here is another uh, example, um, which is maybe more coming from commercial farming. But people always ask, but can you trust this data and so on? And how can we make the uniformity better inside fields? And this is an example from Kazakhstan, where actually we calculated this, uh, this data of crop production on a 10 by 10 meter. And we converted into maps of corn yield of maize. And so this was based on, uh, on satellite data. Some of the data came from WAPOR. Other ones we have processed ourselves. Um, it's a 10 meter by 10 meter grid. But I like this one because this was picture was measured by a an, uh, an combined harvester with a yield sensor. Uh, so here also you can see in red, they have here um, lower yields uh, and they, this, they, they, they exactly match uh, with, this, with the satellite images. So um, th this really gives me comfort that even at a local scale, uh, uh, we can get this production very much right. Now, my last part of the story is a little bit more on, uh, yeah, are we providing data um, to users? Uh, are we in search of users are, or are users in search of data? Uh, so who, who are the users? Now, uh, commercial farms, uh, many, but also smallholders in India. And very interestingly, these smallholders now express continuation. And they will pay, they will pay for the service. Even during Kharif, during the monsoon, they want to continue with the service. They do not want to wait until the next dry season, which I think is very nice. 
uh, but also farmer cooperatives, um, commodity traders, sugarcane uh, uh, mills, and so on. Uh, but very often also, uh, you know, local consultants. And see, farmers are not trusting high tech people and IT companies, but they trust the local consultant. Okay, so. If we can reach out to these local consultants, then also they can start uh, representing uh, these new technical capabilities. And this is, I would say, all more farm and, and agriculture based. In addition to that, um, I see now also that many of them uh, are uh, selling uh, weather stations or soil moisture sensors or drip lines. You know, companies are selling drip lines now also say, look, not only you can we we sell you a drip line and drip irrigation, but also you get a software package how to operate that uh, uh, investment, uh, which I, I think is is quite interesting. But also irrigation districts. Huh? So um, sometimes you have a conflict between farmers and the irrigation district. And you can only solve a conflict if you have one joint database, and these are also people that use the data. Um, very interestingly, a long time ago, um, I, I was having an office of 30 people all um, processing images. Now we do it with two, my son and myself. And we run everything in the cloud. Uh, so, uh, and, and these are countries that we are active. So at the moment we give more than 25 countries, uh, we give day-to-day -day irrigation advice. Uh, so it, it is really possible if you find the farmers. But that's, not, that's the point. You cannot find them so easily. So I believe in a very strong um, uh, network of partners, local partners. Uh, uh, that they, they want to work with local partners that they have already been working with. Uh, and and, and they, they have a client database uh, on, on how to reach them. So that is very important for the upscaling. And um, with this, um, I hope I have answered uh, your question, Rana. And thank you. Back to you. Thank you so much, Vim. Um, I think you answered the question. I am curious, though, um, how do farmers react on um, this type of application? Well, they uh, they are first of all they are surprised that uh, that I know the soil moisture variability in, in their farm. <laughs> um, it's always like um, first, like, hey, is this really true? Uh, can it be true? And then they go into the field and they check it, and and then they see that indeed certain places are drier than other places. So farmers are not easy to convince. Mm. Um, it's unfortunately a very conventional sector. Um, but if you find these early adapters, and and it doesn't matter the size of the farm, I found out whether they have one hectare or they have sixty thousand hectare, it doesn't matter. There is always it's a men, it's a mental thing to be open to new technology. So yeah. they are searching for data. So I like to turn it around. Job was speaking about data in search for uh, users. I like to say that there are a lot of users in search of data. Uh, and the, okay. the whole thing is to get them together. Okay, interesting. So you both have sort of different perspectives on demand and supply. Um, thank you for this, Wim. I would like to move on to uh, Hans. And again, I would like to pull out our poll and ask the audience, uh, who do you think are the main stakeholders of Cerberus? Mm -hmm. So Cerberus is a um, sort of game-based crowdsourcing platform, and it translates satellite data into maps using gaming. So I am very curious who um, you think are the main stakeholders. I'll give you again um, some 15 seconds for this. I see here the answers are varying much more than the first two tools. So this will be interesting also for me. I'm actually quite curious. <clears throat> Let's give it another uh, five seconds. So I see that farmers are again taking the lead. Also universities, uh, research institutions. Now farmers again is taking the lead. So yeah, Hans, could you sort of uh, free us from our misery and explain to us mm -hmm. what this platform really entails and who are the main stakeholders? 
All right. Well, thank you. Uh, well, actually, nobody is wrong. So it is quite a versatile platform. However, there's a big difference uh, because, uh, of course, we have the general public uh, is answered here. And but the general public, in our case, is a resource because we use the general public to uh, look at satellite data, to explore uh, areas, uh, to say what they see. And this data is turned into maps and into information. But I will uh, explain this, uh, of course. I will tell you shortly what I do and where I see synergies, especially also with um, VAPOR. We are not really a uh, VAPOR user, but there are similar goals i think uh uh there are we we explore so i will share my screen and i will just uh, start off and just just uh, sit back and relax how do i share my screen uh, oh i have to choose share screen one and uh, just checking you should see my screen right now yes we do yeah all right okay uh well thank you and uh, thanks for inviting me to give a short uh presentation today about our uh solution uh well yeah my name is hans van der Wout. i am from the netherlands and uh i'm the the founding ceo of the company blackshore but our main product is uh, cerberus and cerberus is a crowdsourcing platform uh, we have developed it uh, mainly supported by the European Space Agency, and it is a platform in which we turn satellite data into maps, into information, but the different way it is, we use human intelligence for this task, and not algorithms or machines. And the thing is, uh, uh, you've already said that well, we are living in like a big, uh, we have, there's a big wealth of available data uh, of the world, especially related to remote sensing data and satellite data. But it is data, it are just pixels. And how do we turn this into knowledge? And especially how do we uh, turn it into knowledge with a big meaning and uh, yeah, just to describe environments. And for this, we as humans, uh, we are still superior than computers at detecting objects in images. And so uh, how do we do it? And uh, who are our users? Well, mainly in a game engine, uh, we simulate world areas uh, as is using or open data or ultra high resolution satellite imagery of uh, this case is 50 centimeters and uh, we are working in areas where there's a certain need for a user, uh, a customer, for example, needs a map. Well, this is an area in, uh, in Mali and an end user here is an NGO who installed water pumps in the region uh, of 100 square kilometers. Uh, the NGO is named Uduma and they donated water pumps to their uh, donors. But what they would like to see what is now the positive impact of these water pumps. Is a certain area thriving? Is our investment worldwide, uh, worthwhile? So are there more roads? Are there more farms, more buildings? Uh, is the environment healthy? Well, you can uh, measure this, of course, in two ways. You can go there and take interviews with people. Is it really working? Or we can look from space. Uh, what, how, what does the area right now look like? So we did the second option. And uh, what we do is to uh, put this uh, satellite data in a gaming engine. And we ask the public, the players, uh, and uh, just the general, general players, uh, to let, look at those images and explore it and say something about the area. Well, the method is that we subdivide the satellite image in hexagons, as you can see. And as a player, we ask, what do you think there is inside of a hexagon? So do you think inside of hexagon, there is like a building, a house? And if you click on it, or if you mark it, you get a reward in the game. And uh, if the reward is very high, also other players are saying the same thing. 
and this reward uh, involves future credits you earn in the game and you use those credits to upgrade your um, game uh, to upgrade your virtual airplanes or whatever and uh, we really look at existing game market why are people so addicted to games and uh, we use similar methods but the only thing is we replace the fake environments for real world environments uh, well and if lots of player uh, people play this uh, and they learn around the area they are getting immersed in real uh, areas especially here in mali and the uh, output for the customer does look a little bit like this so this is data uh, accumulated of all players together and uh, we, we're doing some statistics. And what is the result is a topographical map of an area. And for example, if we put our map on, on top of Google Earth or OpenStreetMap or Bing Maps, you see this. So here there's like a river is mapped, but if you look in Google, this river is unknown. It is not mapped at all. Or there are a lot of communities out here and uh, or those white lines are roads, uh, there's vegetation. So creating those maps is telling us, well, there's, there are a lot of areas in the world which are still needed to be mapped. So this is a somewhat older project that we have done, but right now we are actually working on a project to measure the impact on COVID on wet production. And we're doing this also together with the European Space Agency. And here our first area is uh, Ethiopia. Uh, we, there's a hypothesis that wet production in Ethiopia has been impacted by COVID. And we want to detect trends in this. But for this, we want to map um, actually the entire wet volume of the entire country of Ethiopia. This is a big country. Uh, in this, we are building a um, consortium. Uh, we are working with the consortium, but we are using our crowd data to train uh, algorithms uh, to automatically detect these features. And we are building here a hybrid system between the use of commercial satellite data and open data. And commercial data is expensive, but it has a very high resolution. You can zoom into 50 centimeters. And uh, we are asking our public to map based on this commercial uh, data, but use those coordinates as training locations for open data, for free data on 10 meter resolution. Um, well, in this case, in Ethiopia, in the Rift Valley, we asked the crowd to map during the harvest season. We asked them to map for uh, wet, also for maize and for uh, barley. And we are asking the crowd to map based on actual harvest conditions, because if we look in the season, in the growing season, everything is green, so it is hard to distinct uh, types of vegetation. Uh, but if we really mapping, especially on the moment on the harvest season, we can distinct those crops and the harvest methods are proxies for the actual crop growing there. So we are building Farmville in view. Uh, well, how does it look like in the game? Well, you see it um, uh, shortly. You see it here. So you see those um, those hexagons, and the player is tagging on the hexagons what they see there. So um, there some hexagons they contain uh, vets, some of them contain buildings, other contain maize or uh, or uh, barley, for example. And uh, we find out that actually the players are, uh, for the players, it is quite addictive to play this game. And it is generating us, of course, our results with, with the needs. And like uh, in one week, 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 we created about like 100,000 uh, data labels. So that is, uh, that is very interesting and very important. So what does here the output map look like? This is a pair, an area of the Rift Valley that we met and uh, we are mapping on very, very high resolution. And uh, for example, this is about wet detection and all of those yellow triangles is where we are really like 100% confident that it is indeed wet. And each triangle has a size of 20 by 10, uh, 20 by 20 meters. 
uh, but uh, 20 by 10 because of it is, it is a triangle. And we are using those very small locations as training labels for that information. And we can use this now to build data models, also to map, uh, to estimate wet yields over time through the years. So it is about crop volumes instead of uh, water. Uh, however, I will right now fast forward to, uh, I have one minute left, so I will fast forward to what we are doing and where there's a synergy between, uh, let's see, between Vapor and what we are doing. So uh, we also met an area in other projects using open data, and there we asked the crowd to map, okay, where are there healthy crops and where are there unhealthy crops? In uh, Mali, we met an area of 10,000 square kilometers using open data, and uh, we were asked to uh, see, okay, where is the area drying out? So we compared data over time, 2015, 2018, and we saw a very big area getting brown. But we wanted, uh, we found that out, but that raised the question, why is this uh, land getting so unhealthy? Is it climate change or not? Uh, what we also saw like communities and they were growing those communities and it was a project to estimate a uh, risk of human conflict in the region and uh, because the region was getting browner and we think okay well there's less workable land uh, uh, in the field so probably less food and we detected communities, but we also detected growth of communities. And uh, we saw over the years very slightly growth, so more people packed together. But what is the cause of this? And then we went to vi revisit this same region in Mali and to check, okay, what is the health of the crops and uh, where does the water go to? Uh, this is a very simple NDVI actually saying something about crop health and we asked the crowd okay can you map which crops are, he are healthy and get a lot of water and which crops are unhealthy and do not get a lot of water and in Mali we found out there are like fast plantations and that are really like industrialized sugarcane plantations and it is all connected to the Niger Delta and this is where the water is going on. And for me personally, it was quite an eye opener about like uh, the sugar cane being turned into biofuel we use here in Europe. And then we feel we are really great uh, green. But for Mali, it is not the most healthy situation. And this probably this water usage or the, the poor distribution of water, is it really climate change or is something else going on? And this region actually is also the Mali region in Vapor, the, the same region what we mapped. So here you see the region in uh, Vapor and the dark areas are where a lot of water is being used. And uh, this is our map on top of it. And the orange areas are where a lot of water is being consumed. Although of course Vapor is accumulating data over time and we use a single satellite shots and we can also zoom into the region uh, well vapor is really also showing it like on a 30 meter resolution and our data on top of it uh, a slightly higher resolution so we get similar results and that is really interesting and so also by the way quite uh, um, how do you say it um, uh, this word uh, well um, it's really nice that we turned out to have analyzed the same region uh, as for Mali, uh, so to say. So I'm right now um, really getting over time. So uh, yeah, could you uh, please round it up, Hans? Thanks. thanks for your uh, attention. And probably there will be a lot of questions. Thank you so much. Um, I would quickly like to ask you a question because are the users or players aware that they're contributing sort of to the creation of these maps? Yeah. Or absolutely. are they? Yeah. Okay, they are. Yeah. Okay. That is, uh, may, yeah. And they understand their mutual goals. And uh, it's, uh, uh, of course, what is important are for the game motivational effects. And uh, those are game elements, but they're really aware it are real world situations. 
Okay. Uh, we especially see it, for example, we also map disasters and crises uh, like uh, uh, storm damage or whatever. And yeah. especially then even the crowd is even more uh, uh, more active. We also have done things with uh, refugees in uh, in Iraq. It were like uh, those, uh, were the, the, it was the Yazidi mountain range and then people are really, really extra motivated. But they see yeah. for farming environments, they're also aware of it. But then uh, we, uh, we need additional gaming elements because farming conditions are often a little bit more boring for the players. So then we need to turn on many more game elements. Mm -hmm. And if we map a disaster, then the game elements are in their way, actually. And then people okay. just want to help out. So there's a balance. Okay, thank you. That is quite interesting. Um, I see we don't have much time left, but I would like to still go to the uh, questions of the audience. And I see a very long question of Alexander Mueller on the sort of, um, he mentions a case about the usage of vapor in Egypt. Um, Alexander, can you maybe unmute yourself and um, ask your question? I think this one is addressed to you. And if you can, could you keep it um, under two minutes? Yes, thank you very much. I will try. Uh, currently, we are working with the World Bank on a, a policy note for irrigation modernization. And uh, one of the tools we use for that is the agricultural sector model for Egypt, which I'm running for the last 20 years. Um, the model we use currently has been calibrated for the year 2014, 13-14, uh, uh, with the actual uh, release, water release from the high Aswan Dam, um, the water used by municipal and industrial uh, um, users, open water evaporation, the inflow to the delta, and the outflow to the delta. And the water that, that remains is available for agriculture. Now, um, what, what I calculate is that there is uh, some 30 billion cubic meters of water available for agriculture. And uh, with the historical cropping pattern as recorded by the Ministry of Agriculture, that can irrigate that cropping pattern only uh, for 75% of, of the full water requirement. Now, if um, in our team is also somebody from FAO, and he has done the calculation with WAPOR uh, to verify. And now the, the curious thing is there that uh, WAPOR calculates 40 billion cubic meters. And so there's 10, 10 missing. And this 40 is exactly the amount you would need to, to fully irrigate all the crops that are recorded by the Ministry of Agriculture. So um, yeah. I'm, I'm puzzled what is wrong. Either the Egyptians uh, get more water from the high Aswan Dam than they admit. They would need to have some 70 billion cubic meters to afford this 40 billion for evaporation, or there is something wrong with WAPO. So I'm very curious to, to find out where the, where the difference is. Job, can I ask you to reflect on that? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's a very interesting question, Alexander. I think it, it, it's really uh, it, it, it's it's really an issue where experts come in. I mean, uh, what kind of model? What kind of which which which? How your anal analysis has taken place? So uh, it we have a lot of people here within. I, I've seen names, in fact, which 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 really I think should be part of this, this, this discussion. And what I propose is that we have a separate discussion on this one, otherwise it becomes a, a, a discussion about models, et cetera. So I think we, I put already in the Q and A also my email. So it's good, I, it's a, I mean, we have to solve it. I think definitely. So I think this is a very interesting case. The fact that we should go more into depth and really, because it's, it's also a sensitive issue. I mean, that, that, sure, sure. that's another point. I mean, it, it's, it's, yeah. If you talk about data being transparent, then in fact this is it's only transparent in this forum, but not over there. So I mean, yeah, it's, okay. so I will be happy that we just continue this discussion in a separate setting. Okay, 
Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. I, no I sent you some stuff okay. over email. Thank you very great, much. Great, great. I suggest in that discussion, you also take up Iman Tantawi, who also had a sort of response to um, Alexander Mueller. Um, the next question I see is from Abel Smith, and Abel asks um, whether you can mention some good examples of startups. Uh, well, there are examples, but I mean, I do not know exactly the names of the people there. I mean, we had, we had these, these hackathons and because that should be mentioned actually, because IHG is giving a, a, a is really giving courses in this, and they had hackathons. I mean, in the Arabic language, in French, and in English, and um, so they were prize winners, and they already teamed up, and they had international, they had international uh, 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 startups, where you had people from, you had. Uh, students and, and young professionals from Nigeria, together with people from from Egypt and from 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 uh, uh, that case, I think Mali. So they already, I mean, they already prepared apps also for the drought uh, uh, and, and um, the people walking with the herds in uh, in Mali. How you how you walk from zone to zone where there is biomass, where you have agriculture, where you have grass for the herds to... Uh, to uh, but I can give you these... Uh, I, I, it, it may be good, as you mentioned, I mean, it may be good to make a list of the startups which already are, uh, are already working on this. It's a good point. I will, I will just... Uh, I will put it on the, on the, on the web. Okay. Thank you, uh, Abel. Thanks, Abel. Um, I see a question from Michel de Zwart, and I think Michel is from RVO, if I'm correct. And he asks about um, the role of insurance companies' interest in terms of agricultural risk management. Um, Michel, could you reflect on your question and then um, we can give the floor to our speakers? Yes, uh, uh, very quickly indeed. Um, insurance companies are very hesitant to step into uh, agricultural risk management. There are some pioneers, amongst them uh, Swiss Re. So I was indeed wondering uh, uh, if organizations as such are also using data uh, from uh, WAPR for their own risk management portfolio. Are there already concrete examples of it? So either Joop, Wim, or Hans would like to take the lead on this question. Yeah, I I, I like to take that lead here, Donna. Um, yes, there are many local agricultural uh, insurance companies that already use this kind of data. So the one uh, that I like to mention is WRMS, uh, Weather Risk Management System in India. Um, you see, those companies, they, uh, they only uh, make the insurance if they uh, themselves have no risk and they always want to know two things two things one is um, is the yield really low and therefore they use satellite data and number two um, is it because of poor management or is it because of weather and, uh, and so they also need additional data and WAPOR and other um, uh, spatial data uh, tools can provide additional information on the climate uh, climate system but the climate has been the problem or like in, in the case uh, that I work with these guys, they use um, also IDIWatch data to give daily advice. So if they see that the farmers are not following up the daily advice, yeah, then they get no payout. Uh, so they really, I would say fully embrace it. But this India, big country, many farmers, uh, but that is uh, a big, uh, big success. Thanks. Thank you, Wim. Um, I see there are no other questions left in the chat. Um, I would like to ask the panelists whether they still have some sort of final reflections um, on this table talk. If there is still something they want to get off their chest. Yeah, maybe very brief. Um, see, I've been working in this field for a long time, for 35 years. And the first 25 years, I was only busy working on convincing people that Earth's observation is also a measurement. It's not something fancy. It's really a measurement, but people did not believe me. So I had to go back to science and again and again and publish and check it and do it and so on. That part now hopefully is over. You know, we are, it's now accepted. 
and and I think that is very important for today. That uh, more and more people, even farmers, conventional farmers, are now open uh, and have a different mindset than 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 in the past. And I think that is fundamental uh, for creating uh, changes. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much, Vim. Um, well, uh, and I just just as a last as a oh Hans, you're your Oh yeah, I have something. Yeah, I actually concur with uh, Wim. I always find out that my biggest competitor is the status quo. It is just uh, often organizations they keep to how it is being done, and uh, they do not really are aware of Earth observation or do not really believe it. But if you show them what can be done, it are always um, eye openers. And uh, for my for myself, I do feel privileged. I am um, one of the few that also pushes this Earth, this Earth observation data in the living room of the people. So I do not, yeah, keep it into in the science domain, but yeah, we really make sure yeah it is being pushed in our game engine to be shared. And right now, yeah, we have a crowd of sixty-five thousand people worldwide. who are all actually are already like GIS engineers without even knowing it because yeah we make the uh, the interface very user friendly so um yeah we are we are getting there but it is a long uh, long run and um, yeah an organization change slowly but we must certainly not give up because it is so important and we have those organizations behind us of course building the satellites who really love us uh, uh, because yeah we make use of it thanks hans you hope you have some final remarks as well right yeah well i mean for for me the trigger effect i, I think it really it did it, it, it the first thing i want to know is uh, the one who visited me in in in, in yemen was if of course was Wim bastian so i mean he was the one who introduced me to the whole seed with the, the, the whole field of of remote sensing and what me triggered me at that time is that Really, there's a lot of investment uh, uh, by donors and by IFIs, in fact, in water resources. Hmm. And till girls are walking for hours and hours to collect water. You know, the whole wash sector is, is really a sector that we really, that, that it is really urgent to be solved. And, and an important part of this is that often the water is misused. There are so many examples that water is misused and girls are still walking for hours because they there is simply no water in the tap. So this tool also will gives us more transparency about, about equitability. I mean, how the water resources are used. I mean, the fact that the wash issue is not a matter of investment. It is also a matter. I mean, do your wash, do you use your water wisely? So that's for me it was also a trigger in fact to be very clear on this whole one point. Thank you so much, Job. And I see there is some exchanging of contact information going on in the chat. So I assume a lot of discussions will be taken offline. Um, I would like to formally close this table talk. Um, I would end, would like to end with mentioning that IHE Delft has an open course on water productivity and water accounting using Vapor. And the course is available in English, French, and Dutch. And the link is already provided in the chat. Um, the link, the session is recorded and will be available on the website soon. And I would also kindly like to ask you to fill out the evaluation form of this table talk. So I hope you all enjoyed, and I wish you a lovely day in this uh, in this weather, in this sunny weather. So uh, enjoy the day, and thank you so much to all the speakers. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you, Anna. Bye bye.